Yeah, well, good morning to everyone. Welcome to The Well here at STSA, where we are in a four-part series called I Am. And the most important thing during this series is my microphone is really, really, really loud, but they're getting it straight in the back. There we go. All right. So in this series, what we're doing is, as the, the name implies, is we are trying to discover who Jesus is in his own words. Because there's a lot of things that people say about Jesus, a lot of things maybe we were taught to believe about Jesus, a lot of things we may re read about Jesus, but we are doing is going to Jesus in his own words. And seven times in the Gospels, Jesus said, I am, and then he told us about who he is. And what we're trying to figure out is not just who he is, but as the subtitle says up there on the screen, is I am, so who are you? Because last week we started off by talking about the first and most important of the I am's, which is I am the resurrection and the life. And because Jesus says, I am the resurrection, I am alive, I am not, I'm no longer in the tomb, I am here, I am with you. So everything that he says that he is, is now available to me and to you. And that's the beauty of what we're talking about here in this series, is we're seeing who Jesus is, and we know exactly who he is, and then we realize that all that is available to me. Last week, like I said, we talked about I am the resurrection and the life. And that was the first one that we started with because that's the kind of the most important one. That sets the stage for everything else. As I read one time somewhere, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't true, nothing else matters. But if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true, nothing else matters because the resurrection is kind of the linchpin of all of Christianity. Christianity is based on the fact that our God took flesh, died, and rose from the dead. And if that's true, then everything else that he says is true. Because if somebody, as the saying goes, if somebody predicts his own death and resurrection and pulls it off in only three days, you go with whatever that guy says because he's the real deal and what he says can be trusted and is true. Now this week, we're going to see the second I am statement. And this week, if last week was Jesus telling us, I am powerful, I am almighty, I've conquered death, there's nothing that can stop me, even the grave cannot stop me, even the power of Hades, nothing is more powerful than me. If that was last week, this week we see Jesus telling us what is it that he wants to do with that power. And this is truly where Jesus separates himself from every other religious leader, political leader, whatever kind of leader on the planet. Because most people who are powerful and claim to be powerful don't do so for the reason that Jesus does. Today's I am statement comes from John chapter 10, which says this. John chapter 10 verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Most people who claim to be powerful don't say this. Most people say, I am powerful. I am almighty. You will lay down your lives for me. You will give yourselves up for me because I am powerful. And that's what you do for someone who is powerful, but not Jesus. The good shepherd says, I am powerful, but my power is not for my benefit. My power is for your benefit. My power as a shepherd is for the sake of the sheep who follow me and who look up to my shepherding. So today we're going to talk about what I would say would be one of the most appealing qualities of Jesus Christ, which is shepherding. And I chose this particular topic for this Sunday for a reason, because today is a day called Mother's Day. And so often we look at the fatherly qualities of God because God is our father. But did you know that God also emb embodies not just the qualities of a perfect father, but a perfect mother as well? And never is that more true than what we're going to talk about today. We talk about this good shepherd who lays down their life for the sake of the sheep. Perfect message for Mother's Day. That's our subject for today. But before we get into the Bible stuff and the Jesus stuff, let me tell you this. I love the image of the good shepherd. I know people around here do too. Maybe in your house. Okay, how many people in their house have a picture of Jesus, the good shepherd, Jesus with the sheep? Okay, so a lot of people do this. For me, it's my favorite picture. When I stand to pray, okay, there's two spots I like to pray. This is one of them. I like to pray in front of the picture of Jesus holding the sheep. Okay, you know that. It's a beautiful picture because it just shows that like everything is taken care of for that sheep inside the shepherd's arm. Shepherd is, shepherd is taking care. Shepherd is providing. Like, all is good in the arms of the shepherd. And I like it because it reminds me, number one, of who he is. He's a shepherd who takes care. But it also reminds me of who I am. And I am the sheep. And if you love this idea of a good shepherd, realize there are certain implications, shall we say, of him being a shepherd. And that means that you are the sheep. 
Sheep don't have the best reputation in the world. Sheep are commonly referred to as the dumbest animal that there is that exists. And if I say a sheep is dumb, your response to that should be, how dumb are they? <laughs> Once upon a time, there was two sheep who were walking together and they fell into a ditch. And they couldn't get themselves out. So one sheep started yelling, help, help. No one answered. And he yelled out again, help, help. Nobody answered. So the second sheep said, maybe this would be more effective if we yelled together. So the first sheep said, together, together. <laughs> sheep are dumb. Sheep are dumb. Anybody ever go to the circus and see trained sheep do anything? Like they can train elephants in the circus. They can train lions. They can train monkeys, like even fleas. Fleas have a flea circus. Sheep never do nothing. You never hear of like sheep doing tricks or trained sheep doing anything. Sheep, their only highlight, sheep just kind of sit there. The only highlight for the sheep is once a year on the annual Christmas pageant, okay, whatever local school where the sheep come out because that's where the sheep shine. Other than that, sheep have no value. And did you know how many times in the scriptures are we referred to as sheep? More than 200 times you and me are referred to as sheep. Now, I ain't the brightest guy in the world, but I think there's a message that's trying to be sent here from God to us. Because when you look at sheep and you see how they behave and you see their characteristics, you realize there's a lot more similarities to us than you may realize. Let's go through four reasons why we might be referred to as sheep. You tell me if any of these things, I'll tell you some characteristics of sheep. You tell me if any of these sound familiar to you and me in our lives today. Sheep, first of all, get lost very easily. Sheep get lost very easily. Okay, and some of the husbands are like, yeah, I see it here. Okay. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Okay, back in the pre-GPS days, I would have said the same thing about my wife. If she's got GPS and the backup GPS, she eventually makes it there everywhere that she needs to get to. Sheep get lost very easily. Sheep get distracted very easily. That's why there's a famous verse. Help me out. You may have heard this verse from the book of Isaiah. It says that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one to his own way. We all, like sheep, have gone astray because sheep, go astray. Sheep get distracted very easily. Sheep are right here in the line, okay, and they're walking in the line with the shepherd, and they're right here, and they're walking, and they're just following step by step, and then all of a sudden, they see a bird. Hey, look at that cute bird. And there's a butterfly over there, okay? And then that butterfly lead them to a something, and sheep all of a sudden, and then they look up, and they find themselves very lost. This doesn't sound like me and you, does it? Doesn't sound like me and you spiritually, does it? Because spiritually, sometimes we're on the right track and where everything's good. And then all of a sudden, something came and distracted us and something else distracted us over there. And then all of a sudden, those commitments and those promises and that we're never going to or we're always going to. All of a sudden, we look up and we found ourselves in a very lost place because sheep get lost very easily. Number two, sheep are defenseless. Every animal has a way to defend themselves. Cats have claws. Bees have stingers. Rams have horns. Some animals have no way to defend themselves, like physically, but at least they have like, like a gazelle. Can't defend itself in a fight, but a gazelle is so fast you can never catch it. Even when it comes to like a squirrel, like a squirrel at least has the instincts that no matter how much you try to catch them, okay, they always dodge the traffic. Like at the last second, no matter how much you try, don't worry. The squirrels, it's built in. They always jump out the way. But a sheep, what's a sheep going to do? Bah, you to death? Bah. Like, what's a sheep going to do? Sheep can't fight. Sheep can't run. Sheep can't outsmart. Sheep can't jump. Sheep can't do nothing. Sheep, without a shepherd, have no hope. Tell me if that sounds familiar to you. Number three, sheep are stubborn. And this, by the way, were all the ladies who got nudged by their husbands in number one. You nudge them back here in number three, okay? Sheep are stubborn. There you go. <laughs> That's a good one. Sharp elbow. I like that one. Sheep are stubborn. Now, here's the thing is, take it from me from experience. Stubborn is not good. Stupid is not good, but you put stupid and stubborn together and it's a very bad combination. And that's where sheep find themselves. Sheep sometimes, you can look this up when you go home, sheep sometimes, a sheep would be walking through like the mountains and it would go through and there'd be a tight, narrow opening and a sheep would go and try to squeeze in and a sheep would get stuck because it kind of squeezed in like that and it gets stuck. What does a sheep do when it gets stuck? Keeps trying to squeeze its way forward. And the more stuck it gets, the more, like, just put her in reverse, buddy, and back out of that thing and go around. But the sheep don't do that. They keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going. You tell me, does this sound like us? We, made, we, were, we were on the right track. We made a bad decision. So what we do, we had another bad decision on top of that. And then we should repent and walk. No, we're going to try. And we're going to fight our way to get through there one way or the other because we all 
kind of like sheep, we're stubborn. Number four, sheep are filthy. Sorry to say it. Sheep are dirty. Don't believe the pictures that you see on the TV and the commercials with the sheep and the, the, the paper towels or the, the cotton, whatever it may be. The, don't believe none of that. Those sheep that they put on the TV have gone through the car wash beforehand. Okay, They've gotten themselves cleaned up. Sheep are dirty. Sheep are filthy animals. You know why? Because they're not smart enough to clean themselves. And I'm telling you, 200 times in the scriptures, we're referred to as sheep. And that tells me something, that in the eyes of God, stick with me on this one. This is going to sound bad, but it's going to get good. In the eyes of God, none of us is good. Like, see, here on earth, we see that, like, that's a good person. That's a not so good person. That's a bad person. But truthfully, we're like nitpicking. We're picking out very small differences. But in God's eyes, nobody is good. Nobody is righteous. That's why it says, St. Paul says it. It says, there is none righteous, none who has done good. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The analogy that I always give, one time it hit me, it, this came, became very clear to me when I was on an airplane. When I'm on an airplane, I hate flying. When I'm on an airplane, I'm very close to God. Physically, I feel like I'm close to God, and I also feel like I'm going to die, so I pray very hard on airplanes, okay? So one time I was getting on an airplane, and I was feeling particularly bad about myself, feeling like I'm very bad. Or maybe I was feeling very good. I don't remember, but I remember it was bad, but it could go either way. And I remember looking down over out the window and seeing all those big, tall buildings. I don't remember what city I was leaving. All those big, tall buildings. When you're up there at 20,000 feet or 30,000 feet or how many thousand feet, how big is the tallest building? How big is the smallest building? <laughs> no difference. Here on this earth, it's like skyscraper, tiny house, whatever it may be. But from 50,000 feet, it all looks the same, and that's God. There's the saints and there's the sinners. There's the good and there's the bad. All of us of, in God's eyes have fall way, 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 way short. And some of us may be 0. 0.00001 centimeter higher than one another. But like when you're going like 30,000 feet, that doesn't do you much good. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Remember that verse? Also from the book of Isaiah. Bottom line, when you look at these four characteristics, sheep need a shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd. Sheep need someone to take care of them. Sheep need someone to protect them. Sheep need someone to show them the way. Sheep need someone to clean them. And that is the message that's being reiterated 200 times in the scriptures. Not that you get lost easily and you're defenseless and you're stubborn. Not that you're bad. But you have a need, a great need. And that need is for a shepherd. So the good news today is that some of us have been living life on our own. Sheep got no chance on its own. Sheep isn't going to make it to Tuesday on its own. And some of us today have been living life on our own. Some of us today trying to do it all by ourselves. Some of us, like, we know God is there, and we love God, and, like, we like to visit God, and we like to read his word every now and then. But truth be told, we're doing life on our own. We're kind of leaving the shepherd there, and it's like a peer-to-peer -peer relationship maybe. Like, what do you think, shepherd? Okay, that's good. Let me take into consideration. And what I'm telling you today, the message for us today is we have a good shepherd. We don't need to ever be lost and confused. We have a good shepherd. We don't need to ever be defenseless. We have a good shepherd. We don't need to ever be filthy and lying in our own filth. We have a good shepherd who takes care of us and provides for us because he is the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna look at a psalm from the Old Testament, Psalm 23. You've probably heard this psalm before. It's one of probably the most famous of all the psalms where King David says, talks about the good shepherd, okay, and what the good shepherd, the qualities of that good shepherd. And we're going to see, based on this psalm, four characteristics of the good shepherd. Four characteristics of the good shepherd. And if you want to take my message and remove the word shepherd and talk about the good mother, what a good mother is, you will see. That the characteristics of the good shepherd are exactly the same as a good mom. That's why we want to give, pay homage to our moms today, give honor to our moms today by talking about the good shepherd in this. Let's jump in. We'll read the whole psalm, then we'll go back and break it down. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and, goodness and mercy 
shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Based on this psalm, we're going to look at four qualities of the good shepherd, and they're going to be very easy to remember because they kind of rhyme. Ready? He guides, he provides, he corrects, he protects. Very simple, right? He guides, he provides, he corrects, he protects. Let's go number one. He guides. The good shepherd guides us. The psalm started off by saying he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let me ask you a question. Life today is complicated. Life today has lots of decisions we need to make about work and about relationships and about cities to move into in future and what not to do with our kid and what to do with our parents, what to do with ourselves. and what, So many decisions. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if there was someone out there who knew the answer to every question? Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if somebody could like, you know, back to the future, kind of go ahead in the future, tell us if we made this decision, where is it going to end up? And then come back, Marty McFly, and come back and tell us how it works out. Wouldn't that be great if somebody knew the outcome, somebody could see into the future, somebody knew what decision I should make, wouldn't that be nice? Well, the answer is, there is. That's the good shepherd. See, you may not know what happens tomorrow, and I may not know what happens tomorrow. You can ask my advice, and I'm happy to share it. You can ask your friends. But in the end, there's only one person. There's only one person out there who knows the outcome, and that's the good shepherd. Jesus said this in John chapter 10, verse 3 and 4. To him, this is the passage where Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, same passage. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The key phrase right there that I love so much that it's highlighted. The sheep know his voice. The sheep hear his voice. The sheep know his voice. Let me ask you a question. I want you to answer honestly. I know the Sunday school answer. I know the, the, the right answer to this question, but I want, I, want, I want you to dig inside really and be honest with yourself. Do you really believe that God speaks to you? Do you really believe that you can hear the voice of God? Or is that just like church talk? That's just like stuff the priest says to kind of keep himself in business, keep people listening to his sermons. You can hear the voice of God, and I'll tell you what it is, and if you pay $9.99 a month, what? <laughs> do you really believe that you can hear the voice of God? Do you really believe that you can open up their Bible and God can speak to you? Do you really believe that you can close the door to your room and God will speak to you? A lot of people, if we're honest, we don't actually believe it. We want to believe it, but it just kind of sounds like some kind of magic hocus-pocus stuff that people use to abuse others and manipulate others. But I'm telling you, the truth of the matter is, is God does speak. God does speak. Now, when I say speak, the problem is sometimes we consider speak in a human way, in an audible way. Does God speak audibly to people today? Maybe. I'm sure he does. Like, he's God. I'm not going to limit God and say, no, he doesn't. He's never spoken to me audibly. I never heard a voice. I never seen the writing in the sky. But I promise you, God speaks, but he speaks in different ways. Sometimes he speaks through scripture. Sometimes he speaks through a sermon. Sometimes he speaks through a gut feel. Sometimes he speaks through a closed door and open door. Sometimes he speaks through a good friend. Sometimes he speaks through our mamas. Right, guys? Right, ladies? Sometimes he speaks through our moms. Bottom line is, my job is the sheep. I have to trust the shepherd that he's going to speak. And he's not going to whisper like it's the shepherd's job to make sure the sheep hear his voice. It's not like the sheep, like, oh, you missed it. You weren't listening. That's not a good shepherd. Now, the question is, I want to help you out here because I realize this is a little bit vague and intangible. How can I hear the voice of God? Like, how can I do it? And I've given an entire series on this one topic, but I'll just give you one little nugget. Imagine a scenario where there's a room full of 30 women. 30 women together in a room. 30 women in a room together. What do you think they're doing? What's that? Kill each other? Okay, hopefully not kill each other. Okay. <laughs> I would say probably talking, which may lead to killing, okay, but hopefully not. Okay, hopefully not. They're probably talking. It's probably not silent in that room. And imagine that you walked into that room with 30 women talking, and one of those women is my wife. Would you be able to pick out my wife's voice? 30 women talking, all very loud at the same time. Would you be able to pick it out? Most of you know. Would I? Yes. My mother-in-law said, of course. (laughs) Yes, I would. Why? Now, humor me on this. Like, I know this is just easy, but just humor me. Why can I pick her voice out, but you can't? Two reasons. One, some of you today are visiting for the first time. You have no idea who she is. 
You never met her. You don't know my wife. And two, maybe you do know who she is, but you don't hear her on a regular basis. I know her. I hear her all the time. I hear her voice. We'll just leave it at that. I hear her voice a lot. <laughs> you don't know her voice because A, you don't know her, you don't have a relationship with her, or B, you don't spend enough time with her. But I bet you the more time you spend with her, the more you'll be able to pick out her voice. Right now, we're at the point, we're married 21 years. Okay, we're at the point, like in the beginning, maybe, whatever it may be, but now we're at the point, I call her up, hey, Marianne, hey, hey, Abuna, whatever, like just from the hello, I'll be like, what's wrong? Something's wrong. And I'm telling you, from the hello, because now we've gotten that point in our relationship that the voice tells it, because we have practice. Well, the truth of the matter is, when it comes to the good shepherd, number one, you need a relationship with him, and I hope that every single person here has that relationship with him, that you know him in some shape or form. And I'm going to take as kind of an assumption there, but if not, that's the starting point. The second point is you need to practice. You need to practice hearing his voice. You need to open up your scripture, and you need to hear his voice when it's easy. Like sometimes it's easy to hear God's voice. Sometimes it says, honor your father and mother. You don't need an interpreter for that. And sometimes it says, forgive 70 times 7. You don't need an interpreter. You need someone to say, what's the will of God? No, it's right there. Forgive 70 times 7. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Love everybody. Like, you know, if you can't hear God's voice in that, like this is the typical example of tell me what job I should take. Tell me wh who I should marry. Tell me which city I should move to. You didn't hear when God told you to love. You didn't hear when God told you to forgive. You didn't hear when God told you to serve. You didn't hear when God told you to do any of that stuff. But all of a sudden you want to hear God on the difficult. You can't hear on the easy. That's not how it works. You need to practice hearing the voice of God and obeying the voice of God. Because the more we obey, the more he speaks. And the more he speaks, the more we obey. And the more we obey, the more he speaks. That's how it goes. So if you want to hear God's voice, you don't wait till you have a decision to make to say, I wonder where God is. You got to practice. And the way you practice is in the scriptures. But I'm telling you, the good shepherd, he guides. And I'm telling you, the pressure that this can relieve from your life. I'm telling you from my personal experience. Right now, I can think of probably three, four big things off the top of my head. Three or four big things that I am praying for guidance. And I don't know what to do. Like I look, I stand up here and I look confident. I tell you three or four big things. I don't know what to do. But you know where my confidence is? That I know I don't need to decide. I'm going to keep praying until God makes it clear. And I'm not going to move forward, left or right, front or back, until God makes it clear. Because he's the good shepherd. I'm just the dumb sheep. I'm going to sit here, God, and I'm just going to eat the piece of grass in front of me. And I'm going to keep going. And I'm going to trust that if you want me to turn right, or you want me to turn left, you're going to tell me when to go. But I'm not going to guess. I'm not going to guess. I'm not going to just close my eyes and say, well, it sounds like a good idea, so I'm just going to run across the street. No, 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 no. But you're the good shepherd. You say, bring her on in across the street, I run. You say, sit tight, I sit tight. The amount of pressure and stress that can be relieved from your life by getting this, my job isn't to figure out the future. Look here, I'm the leader of the church, not I'm leading church. I don't know anything. I don't know what I'm doing. It's a secret. I don't know what I'm doing. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> but that's not my job to figure out the future. My job is to spend time with him, with a good shepherd, and just do what he tells me to do. His job is to guide. My job is to obey. That's number one, guides. Number two, he provides. He doesn't just guide us. He provides for us. And that's where it said, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. Let me ask you a question. When you go out to the forest, not the forest, the jungle, or you've been on a safari, it's, it's rare to see animals lying down. It said that he makes me lie down. When you see an animal lying down in the jungle, what does that mean? What can you infer from that? You would say that that, that, that that animal who's lying down feels safe, right? He's not threatened because animals that are threatened don't lie down. You could say he's not hungry. He's taken care of. He's full. You could say that he's not anxious, that he's not seeking anything. An animal that's just lying down there is like, I'm good. And I'm picture lying down. Of course, it's not a sheep are, but in my mind, it's like the feet up. Okay, hands back, maybe in a hammock kind of a, 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 a figure. But the sheep that's lying down, I'm not stressed. Someone's taking care of me. I'm good. And it says he leads us to quiet waters. You know why the good shepherd, even the quiet waters, not rushing waters, not rushing waters, quiet waters, because he provides. He provides a place of peace. 
because that's what the good shepherd is. He knows what we need and he provides for our needs if we simply let him. If we simply trust him and stop trying to get it on our own. The sheep that's lying down besides the quiet waters is not one that's trying to grab for himself. It's one who says, I don't know what I'm doing. And the shepherd says, have a seat, son. I got you. There's something that we say during the prayers of the Gregorian liturgy. Okay, the liturgy that we pray on like the feast days that we say that I love this, this expression so much. It says, you, speaking to God, you have not left us in need of any of the works of your knowledge. What that means is, God, you haven't left me in need of anything that I need to know you and to be provided for by you and to reach what it is that you want me to get to. You haven't left me in need. Now, some of us say, no, I am in need. There's things that I'm waiting for. There's things that I need. And I say, no, 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 no. He's the shepherd. You're the sheep. He's the smart. You're the dumb. He's the big. You're the small. He's the master. You're the servant. So when the shepherd says, no, 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 you don't need that. Trust me. I'll give you everything that you need. And if you don't believe me, ask yourself this question. When you are out there grabbing what you need, are you at rest? The one who's out there trying to get more for himself, that's the, one who, that's the picture that you have of rest? Or is that the exact opposite picture? That's the one who's stressed and never at rest. I also remember this when, I, when we pray the Lord's Prayer. And we say, give us this day our daily bread. What that says to me is, look, God, my, my requirements for this day it's your responsibility, not mine. Now, of course, I'm not saying it in a lazy way, but I'm saying in the end, God, give us this day our daily bread. So whatever it is that you give me, I'm good with that. I may not have everything I want, but I have everything I need because you're the good shepherd. He guides. He provides. And the third thing is something that he provides that we may not like so much, but this is part of God's goodness as a shepherd corrects and i say corrects and you say oh i knew there had to be i knew there had to be a catch okay and here comes now he brings out the stick okay here comes the stick with the he corrects think back to when you were younger when i was in uh, middle school there was always everyone knew a kid there was always a kid who was able to do whatever he wanted. his parents let him do whatever he wanted. did you have a kid like this okay did you hate his guts the way we all did okay there was one kid who was always, we're going to call him Joey B, okay, for, the, for that. That's not his real name, but there was a kid. I remember this guy. And he was in our, we were in the grade school. It was a, a kindergarten through eighth grade, so we were all together. Joey B was the youngest of six boys. His parents didn't care what he did. And if you had six boys, like, I get it. I'm not judging them. Like, if I had six boys, like, I wouldn't care. After number three, I'd be like, whatever, okay, whatever happens, happens. He was the youngest of six boys. He had uh, brothers who were like in college and beyond when he was just like in seventh grade. So you can imagine the influence that he had. He had no rules. His parents didn't care what he did. He could go to any movie he want, okay? And his brothers would buy the other boys' tickets to those movies. Okay, his brothers would buy the other boys' tickets to those movies, not myself, okay? And he, he could, he, they had no curfew, no rules. Like to this day, I don't let my kids go on sleepovers because of the stuff that we used to do at this kid's house when the sleepover, because I know what, what, could go, what could go happen at the sleepovers. And we all wished we were like Joey B. We all wished our parents were as cool as his, as easygoing. Until we got older. And, and Joey B's story, without going into details, didn't end very good. I mean, it's not over. He's still alive, but I'm just saying, like, the situation, what was cool in eighth grade and seventh grade, all of a sudden when you hit a certain age became not so cool. And I remember specifically looking back and saying, you know what? I'm thankful that my parents weren't like his parents. I'm thankful for the rules they gave me. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I'm thankful for the boundaries. I'm thankful for the correction. Because if it's not for them, I might end up the way he ended up. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11. It says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Some of us need to highlight that one, memorize that. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. If the father didn't care about the kid, he wouldn't correct him. But whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Now, the good news for us, for our good shepherd, he doesn't wait for you to appreciate his correction in order to correct you. He doesn't wait for you to say, oh, yeah, now I see the value of the boundaries and the rules and the correction and the concept. He doesn't wait for that. If you remember in the psalm that we said, 
said, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. His rod and his staff. You're the sheep. Your shepherd has two instruments, a rod and a staff. Let's start with the staff. That's the happy-go-lucky one. What's a staff for? Staff is to guide. Staff is to shepherd. A staff is so that he can hold it up really high, and the sheep, because there's like a million of them down here, they're like, oh, no, we lost a shepherd. Oh, no, we lost a shepherd. And then they look up, they see the staff, and they just go. It's their north star. So the staff is like, yeah, that's what we love about the good shepherd. What do you think the rod is for? <laughs> what do you think the rod is for? There you go. That's exactly that. If those who can make that noise with that thing, that's what that rod is for. Sheep often, because they're not so smart, they get lost easily. What happens to a sheep sometimes, like I said earlier, they wander off in the wrong direction. So a sheep are moving in the line, and then all of a sudden they get distracted. Now, what would happen to a sheep if it wandered off too much and it went into like a river? Okay, a sheep, okay, they're cotton. Okay, cotton's not well with the water. Okay, it becomes like a big cotton ball. Okay, if a sheep were to fall in there, sheep can't swim. Or, God forbid, if a sheep went made a left turn into the wolves area or the foxes area, whatever it is. Like, it's very dangerous for a sheep if they wander too much. So the shepherd, because he loves the sheep, sometimes has to pull out the rod. And you know what he does with the rod? This is going to sound the opposite. Like, this is very bad what I'm about to say. In 2022, you're not going to be able to take what I'm about to say. He would take the rod, and he would hit the sheep on the leg to the point where he would injure the sheep. And the sheep would not be able to walk. And you say, call animal control or call, you know, child protective service or whatever. It's not like that, okay? It's not like that. The good shepherd. The good shepherd. You know why he did that? He did it for the sheep's sake. Because the sheep that kept wandering to the left, you're going to hurt yourself much more. So he needed to hurt the sheep. But then what would happen to the sheep as the sheep was limping? Sheep couldn't walk, couldn't keep up. So what would the shepherd do? If the shepherd didn't care, let the sheep fall behind, get eaten by the wolves. What would the shepherd do? You've seen this picture. The shepherd then carries the sheep. He injures the sheep, and he carries the sheep. Now think with me here. The problem of the sheep was that when the shepherd told him go right, he didn't go right. He went left. The shepherd was speaking, and the sheep wasn't hearing his voice. So how does the shepherd correct it? He injures the sheep. He carries the sheep. And now the, sh the sheep's ear, as he's carrying it over his shoulders, the sheep's ear is very close to what? The shepherd's mouth. So that sheep gets used to the shepherd's voice. And that sheep hears the shepherd's voice. And the practices hears the shepherd's voice. And it understands the shepherd's voice. And then finally, when it's ready to obey the shepherd's voice, after it's been hearing it, hearing it, hearing it, the shepherd puts it down. And now it's ready. And I'm telling you, The shepherd, King David said in the psalm, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Sometimes the best thing for us is the consequences that we resist. Parents get this. Okay, so if you're a parent, this is not, like if you're a parent, you're, just, you're amen, amen, amen to this one because this is very obvious. Okay, what happens if a child is about to touch a stove that's hot? Do you come to child? Okay, the child's about to touch a stove. You say, excuse me, son, when you have a minute, okay? <laughs> I'd like to have a discussion with you about the effects of fire on the skin. Is that what you do? No. Get your hand down. The sun's about to run in the street. Okay, you don't, you, you, don't, you don't show them a documentary, okay, about what happens. You tackle the kid. Even if you hurt the kid, you tackle him to save his life or her life. And it may require even more consequences. To say whatever it takes to keep you and to keep you safe and protect you. That's my job. Now listen carefully to me on this one. Follow me here. The child who gets smacked on the hand says, my parents are not loving me. They're hurting me. Ow, call the police. The child doesn't understand, right? Because they're just a child. And you would never expect a child to understand you as a parent. The difference between you and your child compared to the difference between you and God. You and your child, let's say that child is five. Let's say you are 25. Okay, go easy a bit. <laughs> let's say you're 25. The child is five. They'll never understand. A five-year-old never understand a 25-year-old. But you know what? In probably about five years, he'll have caught up to you. Okay, and some of them even younger than that. So it's just a matter of a few years. How many years difference between you and God? Five years? Ten years? Twenty years? A hundred years? A thousand years? A like a million years between you and God? Like me and the kid is five years. He's going to be as smart as me. Five years, they're going to be as smart as me. The difference between me and God? Because then if a child doesn't understand, there's going to be times that we don't understand. 
But we know this, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, keyword there, afterward, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That's a good shepherd. At times, our good shepherd knows there's certain consequences that we can't handle. He saves us. He protects us. We say, thank you so much. A miracle. God protected me from the consequences. But sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he knows we need the consequences. Sometimes we need to eat the fruit of our choices. Sometimes we need to eat the consequences. Sometimes we need that. And he knows it's for our best, so he allows it. He allows that relationship to go the wrong direction. He allows that job situation that we pray and pray and pray and we beg others to pray. He allows it for the fruit of our choices. He allows sometimes those decisions that don't work out very well. He allows it. But here's the thing. Take heart in this. He's the good shepherd. You say, I can't handle it. He says, yes, you can. I think he's right and you're wrong. If he says you can handle it, you absolutely can. And that gets us to the last of the four characteristics. We said the good shepherd. Remind me again, the first characteristic, he guides. Say it with me, he guides. He what, not only guides, he provides. That's pathetic. <laughs> Say he guides. he guides. He provides. He corrects. Yes. Number four, he protects. He protects. Let's go back to the psalm and where it, in verse four. It said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Protection. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Then it talks about how he protects us. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Let's stop here on this anoint my head with oil. Again, sheep, not the, not, not the sharpest animals. So what happened with sheep, because they were stinky, because they were dirty and they were filthy, they often attracted flies. And there were certain kind of flies that like to, this is disgusting, I know, but this is the way it is, like to fly in the nose of the sheep, okay? Yeah, like suicide commando mission with these guys, okay? They would go inside the nose, and they wouldn't just stop in the nose. They kept going all the way up into the brain. Maybe because the sheep had a small brain. There's a lot of space up there. I don't know why, but these flies would go up into the sheep's brain. And when they would be up there, they would lay eggs, and they would hatch. And what do you think this would do to the sheep? This would be like a sheep like short-circuiting, and a sheep would go crazy, and what a sheep would do it's bang its head against a mountain or a rock to try to kill the fly because the sheep ain't that bright realize he killed the fly, he killed himself. So he's banging his head against there. So a shepherd put oil on the sheep's head. The oil is like the bug spray. Oil is repellent. So it says right here, you anoint my head with oil. You know that there's enemies. You know there's things I can't handle. You know there's things that are gonna, they're gonna kill me and cause me to kill myself. But what the shepherd does, he takes care. He protects. He puts the oil. He puts the protection. He covers that sheep. And that sheep walks around like he's invincible. You ain't invincible. You just, you just walk in strong because you got a good shepherd. Who knows? He provides. He puts a little fence around you. Goes on, verse 5. And it says, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This picture, my cup runs over. Back to the Old Testament times. The way it worked back then is if you were invited to a banquet or a feast or whatever it was, there was a clear way when the host would tell you, it's time to get going. And the way it was is you would have a cup in front of you, okay, the cup of wine. And what happens is as you would drink that wine, it would get low. The servers would come around and refill you. They would top you off. And then when it was time, it was like time to let these people go home, the time really for me to let myself go home, they just wouldn't top you off anymore and you finish a drink and you knew that was time to get going. Now, what happens here, it says, my cup runs over. My cup runs over, which means that every time I finish, my cup spill, he puts more in. There's no closing time here with God. And that says that in God's protection, in his presence, 24 hours a day, seven days, you never get kicked out of God's presence. Did you know that? That you never, no matter how filthy, how stinky, how bad, how dumb, how stubborn, how nothing, you never, God never kicks you out of his presence. I remember there was a time where I used to, a long time ago, not me, recently, but Marianne used to invite people over and she had a lot of guests and, you know, like the girls. And, uh, so what I do, I just had something very simple. Once we, uh, I discovered the Nest, the thermostat, the Nest thermostat that I control from my phone, i just be upstairs and i just turn the temperature down, okay? And that's the easy way to get rid of the, the ladies. Could one, uh, with time to get, oh, you're so soon? Okay, fine, okay. So I would just turn down the temperature. 
Okay, but what I'm saying is God never turns on the temperature on you. Did you know that? God never adjusts the AC to be like it's time for them to get going. And that's why I say it this way. I'm telling you something that sounds so simple, but I'm telling you, this, could, this is a game changer right here. We all know God loves us. God loves us. God loves us. Anyone ever doubt God loves you? Everyone knows God loves you. But let me tell you what else about God. God not just loves you. He likes you. Did you know that? God likes you. Like loves you, it's like you got to love your enemies. You got to put up with them. But God doesn't just like you. God, or love you. He legitimately likes you. He likes you to be in his presence. He likes you to come to his house. He likes you to spend time with him. He's never like, uh, again with the prayer, God, you need, I got you. He's never like that. He's never like, again with the repentance, like, I told you, stop it. It's not going to work. Like, it never. God likes you. He's a good shepherd. Cup runs over. In his presence, all the days of my life, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Because he's the good shepherd. Now, the bad shepherd will try to convince you the opposite. The bad shepherd will try to convince you, now you're too dumb. Now you messed up too much. Now you're too dirty. No, 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 no. The good shepherd, he got, he's busy. He got bigger things to worry about than you. He got, look at how many people in this church. He got have time for your prayers and their prayers. Like, that's for the bad shepherd. But the good shepherd, nothing is further from the truth. The bad shepherd will try to convince you that the good, the good shepherd doesn't have your best interest at heart. That's what he did to Adam and Eve. Are you sure if you do this, it's going to happen? Who told you that? Are you sure if you obey God, it's going to work out for you? Because I heard that if you do that, it's not going to end well. That's what the bad shepherd does. But that's why the verse that Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. Good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That was John 10, 11. You know the verse right before that? John 10, 10, it's a famous verse. He says, the thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life. They may have it more abundantly. I'm not here for myself. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this message is this. Good shepherd. I'm not here for myself. I'm here for you. I didn't come to say, I'm powerful. You lay down your life for me. I said, I'm powerful. And all that power is for your sake, for your benefit. I want you to have life. I want you to live. I want to guide you into the path of righteousness. I want to provide for you your daily bread. At times, I have to correct you because th th that's good for you. But in the end, I'm going to protect you from the things that you can ha can't handle. Because I'm the good shepherd. And someone, some of you today need to hear this message. Look, I'll tell you something. Mother's Day for me, Mother's Day is a day, I believe Mother's Day is a powerful day. And I believe, you know, I believe it because I believe in the powers, the power of the prayers of moms. Starting with my own mom, because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here today. I believe in the power of prayers of moms in particular. And I'm telling you, I said it earlier jokingly, but there's one thing I know that every mom wants for her kid on this day is to be in church. And I'm telling you, some of you, your moms have been praying for you, and your mom's prayers are going to be answered today. Some of you, your moms have been praying for you. And your moms have been praying that you would get it. And your moms have been praying that you would submit your life to that good shepherd. And some of your moms have been praying that you would finally stop trying to provide for yourself and make it work on your own and that you would simply surrender your life to the good shepherd who guides, who provides, who corrects, and protects. And I believe that through your mom's prayers, some lives are going to be different after today. Last verse. I want to go back to that first verse from the psalm that I think captures the message perfectly. When King David was writing, he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Do you know what shall not want means? King David is saying, King David, what's on your Christmas list this year? Nothing, I'm good. King David, what, what, what's on your bucket list you want? Nothing, I'm good. King David, I want to do you, do you a favor. What can I do for you? He said, I'm good. I'm not pursuing anything. Like how many of us today can say, honestly, we're not pursuing anything? We're pursuing a million things. There's a million things that we want and that we're trying to get for ourselves. King David says, nothing. There's nothing. Can you imagine the rest? If I could truly say, I am perfectly content in life. There's nothing that I want. There's nothing that I need. I got everything. Like, can you imagine? That, that sounds like in the galaxy far, far, far away. But that's reality. But do you know how to get there? The path to get there, there's one step. There's one step to get to I shall not want. And the path to get there is one step is what? The Lord is my shepherd. It's cause and effect. It's cause and effect. 
We all want the effect. I shall not want. Well, the cause is very simple. You say, the Lord is my shepherd. But you don't just say it, you live it. Because truly, he is the good shepherd. He is the almighty. He is the one who is risen from the dead and is alive forevermore. And his almighty power and his almighty everything is for the benefit of you and me. But you'll never realize it until you say, you're my shepherd. You're my shepherd. But the one who says that, God's greatest desire is to make you say, I shall not want. His greatest desire is to make you say, I shall not want. But the only way to get you to say that is to first get you to live by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. Let's stand together for a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are the good shepherd. You lay down your life for your sheep. And none of us would be here, Lord, if that weren't the case. Help us, Lord, this day to submit our lives to you, to trust in you as the good shepherd, the true good shepherd, not to seek our own well-being, Lord, but to trust that you have our good at heart and to follow your voice. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the prayers and intercessions of all your saints. Hear us, Lord, as we pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.